دولة رئيس الوزراء الباكستاني السيد عمران خان شكرا لكم على هذه المقابلة أهلا وسهلا بكم My pleasure. دولة الرئيس دعني أسأل سؤال غير مباشر أو مستغرب يمكن كيف تجدون التنافس من الملاعب الرياضية إلى الملاعب السياسية؟ Well, uh, politics, sports, business, whatever you do, it's a competition. You're competing against other businesses. In politics, you're competing against politicians. So sport teaches you how to compete. It teaches you how to struggle. Uh, a great sportsman is the one who has the ability not just to learn how to win, but also how to lose. A great sportsman learns from his defeat. He then corrects his mistakes, works hard, struggles, comes back again, then goes down, then goes up. And what that does is it gives you the most valuable lesson in life. It's that you, that, uh, you don't get defeated by failures. You just keep, you know how to fight back. And so all the lessons I learned from uh, sports, I applied in politics. Jameel, in addition to the answers you had earlier, what is your plan for the first 100 days as a leader in the country of Pakistan? Well, the most important thing in Pakistan right now is we face uh, economic challenges. And so we have a short term, medium term and long term plan how to get out of uh, our, our situation. Uh, once we get out of the short term and which is what we are doing right now is um, we've come up with a budget where we have whatever resources we've had, we've allocated them such that it allows Pakistan to our industry to grow, our exporters to grow. Uh, so that we, we fight the economic challenges, fix the governance system. We, will fi we are fixing the governance system, which means strengthening the institutions, but that's going to take a bit of time to have effect. In the meantime, we have started a massive austerity campaign, cutting down our costs and trying to, whatever assets we have, uh, trying to uh, use those assets to, uh, go to, to uh, cope with this very challenging time. But... In the medium and long term, Pakistan has tremendous future. It has great potential. It has a young population. It has resources. So at the moment our governance system improves, investment will come in and Pakistan will start to rise. أحد أهم المشاكل موجودة في دولة باكستان هو انخفاض الطبقة الوسطى. يوجد طبقة غنية جدا وطبقة فقيرة جدا. كيف تخططون لتوسيع الطبقة الوسطى التي تساهم على الحفاظ على اقتصاد متوازن وقيم متوازنة أيضا؟ You see what in Pakistan uh, what we have done is we have not spent money on human development which means developing your human resources which means spending money on people's education on health on uh, uh, on providing them justice, um, uh, uh, looking after the employment. So when, when you do not spend money on human development, then uh, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So, so what we are trying to do now is to completely reverse this situation. Try to raise the living standard of our people. Spend on the people. Uh, um, uh, make the rich pay taxes, which they don't pay taxes, and spend it on our poor people, on and raising this uh, their uh, the standard of living by providing for health, uh, improving education in government schools, improving healthcare in government hospitals, uh, and then trying to find employment for our young people. So, you know, it's we have, as I said, short term, medium, and long term plans. But Pakistan will rise when we invest in our human resources. ولكن ألا تتوقعون أن تثور الطبقة الغنية عندما تفرضون عليها ضرائب لم تكن مفروضة من قبل؟ ألا تخشون من غضبة من هذه الطبقة؟ You know, 
whenever you bring, uh, whenever, su supposing it's like a patient who's ill, and when you, uh, sometimes you have to do surgery, so it hurts for a while, but then the patient feels better afterwards. In short term, we, Pakistan will have to go through pain because uh, we have allowed our country to go down. But once uh, we take these corrective measures, reforms, then even the rich people will benefit. No country can survive if there is a tiny uh, peop a rich people island in a sea of poverty. No country can survive like that. China has given us this uh, model where uh, China took 700 million people out of poverty in 30 years. And as it took people out of poverty, China became a great power. So it's a, you know, the other way around is when you make the rich people get richer and you think that they will eventually, money will trickle down to the poor people, it doesn't work. They will have to. Because you, you know, you have to, if in any civilized society, those who have money must give uh, taxes so that people who do not have money, you raise them up. The reason why the Western countries are, especially Scandinavian countries are so prosperous, even European countries, is because the taxes collected from the rich and used to uh, raise the standard of people who are not that rich, poor people. And that's why the countries rise. Uh, in, unfortunately in Pakistan, the total number of taxpayers, 200 pe million people, and total number of taxpayers are about 700,000. So no, you can't uh, survive as a country if uh, you just have the small tax base and you know, expect that you will collect money by taxing the poor, by raising prices, indirect taxes. So uh, I feel that even the rich people in our country will realize that it's unsustainable you, can, you cannot sustain as a nation if, you, if people who have money don't contribute, uh, don't pay taxes. You can't survive as a nation. Let's go to another issue, the President. What is your visit to Saudi Arabia? You chose Saudi Arabia to be the first country you visit after your visit, after your visit to the President of the United States of Pakistan. Why did you choose Saudi Arabia? And what are the messages that you want to send uh, well, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan have long, strong people-to-people -people relationship. People in Pakistan have this high regard of uh, people of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has in the past helped Pakistan when Pakistan has been in need. Uh, and uh, the other reason, of course, is... Uh, an emotional reason because uh, of Makkah and Medina. So anyone who, who uh, comes into power in Pakistan, reason why they come to Saudi Arabia first is A, because we have uh, always had very close relationship with uh, the Saudi government, Saudi people. But B, because we want to come here and go to Makkah and Medina and get the blessings of uh, Almighty Allah, and we want to pay our respects to the to our Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So they are the, they are the reasons why we come here first. Well, you know, just that we stand with people of Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, and uh, because Saudi Arabia has stood with us in our times of need. We will always stand with people of Saudi Arabia in their times of need. Pakistan, the government is Well, we have shown our support for, for the Saudi government. But at the same time, um, we feel it's very important that there should not be any conflict in the Muslim world. Already we have from starting from Libya to Somalia to Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan su has suffered a lot. Conflict, uh, conflict in Muslim world is uh, weakening all of us. 
And so what ideally we would, Pakistan would like to play a role of putting out these fires, of uh, reconciliation, getting Muslim uh, countries together rather than, uh, rather than uh, the conflict. And that, I really see that as the big role of Pakistan. But at the same time, to assure Saudi Arabia that we do stand with them. بس فيما لا تواجه باكستان خطرا من معضله التطرف التي اساءت الى الاسلام في في الغرب وفي الشرق عند غير المسلمين Pakistan has gone through uh, uh, one of the worst periods in our life where uh, we entered into the US war on terror and uh, we ended up uh, having almost 88,000 people have died in Pakistan, and hundreds and billions of dollars of uh, loss to our economy. And so from the lesson we have learned from that is that one must avoid conflict at all cost. Because once a conflict starts, it has unintended consequences. Look at United States uh, in, in Afghanistan. Did they think that they would 16 years down the line and almost a trillion dollars spent on the conflict, they would still be there, and there's still no end to the conflict. Uh, so uh, the lesson is one must avoid conflict, because once a conflict starts, as I say, it has unintended consequences. You don't know where it will go to. لا شك لكن هل تستطيع أن تتجنب الصراع مع المتطرف الذي يكفر الحكومة يكفر رئيس الوزراء يكفر جانب كثير من المسلمين؟ Uh, extremism is an illness. Extremism is, uh, is something when it affects a society. Uh, there is a difference. There is, uh, there is fundamentalism. There is extremism. Then there is militant extremism. What is especially damaging to the society is militant extremism, what we faced in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, full marks to our security forces and our intelligence agencies to overcome all that. Because once the conflict started, the, all those enemies of Pakistan who wanted to destabilize Pakistan jumped in and started backing the extremists. So what was a small conflict became bigger. Uh, so um, fundamentalism, extremism needs to be fought intellectually. But militant extremism, unfortunately, has to be fought uh, with your security forces. As I said, fortunately, Pakistan has, by and large, overcome the militant extremism. What now we need is to uh, start a reconciliation process and getting people absorbed back in the society so that we have stability. <laughs> Uh, you see, Kashmir is, uh, is right now an indigenous struggle. It, in the valley, uh, the people of Kashmir want freedom. And uh, unfortunately, um, what India is doing is it's using force to, uh, to stop people uh, having the right of self-determination, the right to choose their destiny. And this has now been going on for 30 years. All, over a half a million troops in uh, Indian troops are trying to uh, stop this freedom movement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the situation uh, is not improving. Uh, the more force is used, the more people want uh, freedom, and more people get alienated uh, from, um, from, from India, the people of Kashmir. So the, the solution again lies in a political solution. It does not need military force. Military is not going to produce a solution in Kashmir. Neither is military force going to produce a solution in Afghanistan. Both places, there is a political solution there. Corruption, uh, sometimes I wish we could do what uh, Prince Salman did in uh, Saudi Arabia because white-collar crime is very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to fight. 
because people, people who steal a lot of money have big lawyers, can, they can hide their money in offshore accounts. It's a very long process to retrieve the money. But uh, in Pakistan, we have now set up a task force, which is to retrieve our money that has been taken out of Pakistan and, and uh, sp stolen uh, um, in properties abroad. We are trying to get the money back in. So we've started the process. We've just signed an agreement with the United, United Kingdom. And so uh, we, we signed an extradition treaty. And so uh, we are also going to lobby uh, other countries, Western countries, where they should clamp down on money laundering. Uh, I mean, money which is, goes from poor countries into rich countries mm -hmm. is causing a lot more uh, misery, poverty, deaths in the third world than terrorism is. Because this money is stolen from people from developing world and sent to offshore accounts, companies in the West. So we need a concerted effort. We will lobby internationally that there must be an effort to stop, uh, somehow make it difficult for uh, criminals to take money out of poor countries and take them into rich countries. And this needs a concerted effort not just from my country, but also countries, Western countries. دولة رئيس الوزراء السيد عمران خان شكرا لكم لإتاحة هذه المقابلة لقناة العربية شكرا لكم. Thank you.